today we've had a five-part uh, downsizing series and Ellen Dudley, our speaker today, has also been um, sponsoring our series. We had uh, different speakers um, before this and Ellen today is coming on to talk about the actual moving. We had decluttering and um, we had to talk about jewelry and we had about finances and about staging and now the actual, oh my gosh, you know, let's say we, we want to move. What do we do? Do we panic or, 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 or give us some, some information how the process uh, works? So Ellen Dudley is here. She's a, a realtor. She's been selling homes in the suburbs of greater Boston since 2004. She's a senior real estate specialist focused on assisting the senior population with every aspect of the move. Can I ask you, Ellen, uh, just quickly, the senior population versus someone in their 20s in a, in a in couple words, how would that be different? Just in a couple words. I think the number one biggest difference is that the seniors need to know the timeline. They really need me to repeat the timeline after every step and hold their hand through it and not just say, you know, the PNS is on the 23rd and assume that they're going to put that in their calendar and know what I'm talking about. I think I really um, need to explain each each part of the process very thoroughly and make sure they understand it and continue to tell them the timeline as each as we cross each line of contingencies and such. I can just tell everybody before we finish with Ellen's introduction, I just bought a condo on the Cape and I was surprised there's everything is now you don't sit and meet in a lawyer's office. So, you know, last time I bought something was this house 28, 30 years ago. And they have uh, something dot loop that gets emailed to you. And the first time we put a bid on and something and it didn't go through and then another week we bought something. But when, when they sent it, my husband and I were like, wait, huh? What, what are we even supposed to do? So I can, I can relate with the whole holding your hands. All right. Um, let's see here. She's also a luxury home specialist, a certified divorce specialist, which a friend of mine was asking about, and an accredited buyer's representative. Real estate and helping people is her passion, and she's 100% focused on delivering an excellent customer service. And aside from Ellen speaking, she's also going to have a mortgage broker today and, and uh, another token person who uh, used Ellen and used some of the other people that spoke as part of the series. She's going to introduce that person later on as she's speaking to kind of give you the full experience of, of, of what this person experienced. So Ellen, take it away. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Tracy. I'm just getting a text from that person saying that I didn't send her the passcode. Um, Ellen, hang on. if you can just put in the chat her email, I will quickly send it to her. Thank you so much. Let's see. Just give us a second, everybody. We're trying to get everybody on. I'm in now, Ellen. I'm here. This is I Sophia. see you. I see you, Sophia. Thank you. Uh, give me one second. Uh, what well, well, I'm going to give you her I'm going to give you her um, text number if you could just text her sure Uh, okay. The other thing is, uh, peop everybody can either put questions in the general, where it's a, or I think it says to everyone. That's how the questions are, Sean. Yes, to everyone, or you can put it to me. I'm Tracy. Uh, there's already a question, but we'll wait. We'll wait a little bit about that one, and um, then I will interrupt Ellen from time to time and ask a couple of questions uh, in a row. So if you have questions, you can certainly um, put them where it says everyone, or you can put it where it says Tracy. And if it says, if it's to everyone, obviously your name is on it. If it says Tracy, then I won't mention your name. I'll just say there's a question. Okay. Okay, so sorry about that. No so thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. 
Um, I've had a lot of fun hosting this series and um, I hope you have as well. Um, I am going to share my screen so you can, so we can follow along. Um, let's see. Okay, so, so this is me. This is my contact information. I work for Keller Williams Chestnut Hill. Um, I've been there for about eight years. As Tracy said, I've been in real estate for going on my 17th year all around the greater Boston area. And I have learned a lot in this in these years and I have uh, decided to niche my business in different ways along the course of my career. So the first certification that I received was the luxury division, which was, you know, the requirements were to sell X amount of homes, you know, over a certain price point, as well as take some coursework. And then after that, I, um, I, and selling luxury homes is a little bit different from selling regular homes. We, we sort of have a, we have a interesting market here in Boston, pretty much almost everything is luxury, um, just due to the price points that are, that are going crazy this year. Um, but basically anything over a million dollars is luxury and, and you can get a two bedroom condo for a million dollars. So um, I did luxury and then I also did, um, decided to focus on divorce and seniors. And I, I'll be honest with you, I selected these categories because I really enjoy when my customers and clients um, trust me. And a lot of people who, because I know what I'm doing, I've been doing this for 17 years and I know how to do this job really well. And so when someone can trust me and let me save them money or make them money or, or get, get an attorney or a lender who I trust, who I know will do a great job, that is such a, it makes my job easier. And so those are two segments of the population, seniors and people going through divorce who have a million other things on their plate and maybe have more ability to let me do my job on their behalf rather than the busy you know, doctor or lawyer who thinks they know everything about real estate and just throws that into the mix with everything else they're doing and then screws it up in the end. <laughs> I've had that happen a few times. So. Um, that's why I selected these niche, niches, and um, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy working for these these people, this segment of the population, seniors. I love hearing the stories. I love hearing about um, their whole lives. I just I've met so many interesting people, and I just really enjoy it. And um, and divorce, you know, it's not fun for anybody, but. I, it allows me to do my job in a way that helps people that I know I'm, I'm really helping people. So as Tracy said, we did the steps to downsizing. First, we met with Nora Youssef from RBC Financial and she taught you how to get your finances in order and figure out your budget. And, you know, along with that, the finance component it's also important to speak with elder lawyers, estate planning attorneys, and tax advisors. And those are all people that I have connections with. So if you ever need any of those ref references or referrals, please feel free to reach out to me because those are the people who really, you know, help you figure out if you should move, if you can move, where you can move, etc. So after you get your finances in order, the next step is to start decluttering your home and maybe have an estate sale or a jewelry sale or figure out who is going to take, you know, your belongings that you might not want to bring with you. 
and we heard from Eve Ward from Bond and DeVoe and Amy Barrett from A Matter of Brilliance. And hopefully you got a lot from what they had to say. And then we talked about staging your home with Deb Ellis and she showed you a lot of before and afters that I thought were great. And I hope you enjoyed that. And now the last step in our series is me. So I'm here to talk to you and answer any questions I can about real estate. So downsizing, um, yes, it's daunting, it's scary and it's emotional, but it is not impossible. And um, the first thing you should do is decide if moving is the best course of action for you. And you should do that by talking to your children, your doctors, any of your trusted advisors. Um, studies show that injuries resulting from falls at home are one of the leading causes of death in seniors. And so, you know, I am an advocate of, of staying home in place if you do it the right way, if you keep your environment safe. But I do know there are so many other environments where you can be safe and really enjoy your life with community and other people that are, um, you know, also maybe in the same, in the same um, realm of life that you're in and, you know, could be a lot more fun. So staying safe is certainly the priority. And um, I just want you to know that downsizing into another environment is not impossible. So right now in this country, we are experiencing an absolute insane real estate market. Um, most homes across the country are seeing multiple offers. And um, so what does that mean? That means that buyers are paying over the asking price, waiving their contingencies and letting the seller determine the terms. And by terms, I mean the closing dates, uh, when they're going to leave their home. In many cases, they can say, I won't leave until I find the right house. So you can have this house, but you're not, I'm not going to be out in 60 days. I'm going to make it contingent on my finding the right place. And then rent backs are something where if you sell your house, let's say May 31st, but you haven't found a new place to live yet, the current owner will close and give you the money, but you can still stay there for another 60 days or, or longer, depending on what your arrangement is. But that, and sometimes they charge you rent and sometimes they don't. Um, just kind of gives you more, more buying power because you've already closed on the home and you, you don't have to say that your home is contingent on anything and it gives you freedom to, to buy and gives you the opportunity to stay where you are until you're comfortable leaving. Can you hear me okay, Tracy? I'm hearing a weird, oops. Can you hear me, Tracy? Sorry, put thumbs up. Yes, I don't know if my box is next to your box. Oh yeah. no, I can't see anything. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm okay, here. I'm hearing a weird <laughs> echo. Okay, so the interest rates are at all time lows creating buyer demand and COVID has led to pent up buyer demand. Buyers need more space due to working and schooling from home. So the results are top dollar for sellers. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, actually. So, so actually for our audience, most of my guess is, I don't know who's selling their house, but my guess is, um, I remember my parents stayed in their house for, I don't know, 50 years. So I think for a lot of people probably on this call, they've probably been in their house for a long time. So you're saying that it's a seller's market and it's a good time for them to sell. Of course, if they want to turn around and buy something like a condo, it's also going to be a lot. Um, the question I have is if they want to turn around and rent, because rents, I think, have plummeted since COVID, if you can address that. And one more thing, if you can also address, there was a question in the chat, 
what's the price difference between a one bedroom and a two bedroom condo in terms of pricing? And is it better to buy a two bedroom or a one bedroom for resale? Okay, that was a lot of questions. Um, so yes, it's better to buy a two bedroom than a one bedroom for resale. Start with that one, absolutely. Um, I can't tell you the difference off the top of my head. We would need to look at which community we're talking about. Um, it just depends. And yes, you are correct. The, the rental market is plummeting because the interest rates are so low, everybody wants to buy. They want, if they're young and renting in the city, and now they don't have a commute because of COVID. They've been told they can work from home for the next two years. They want to buy, and chances are they want to buy where they get more space, which is typically outside the city, more in the suburbs. So the rental market is very low. It used to be just, just a year ago, before COVID, it was such that the tenant would pay the fee of the realtor, one month's fee. It has now, since COVID, become a situation where they will not pay the fee, the owner must pay the broker fee, and they're offering reduced rents and free months rent, two free months rent, say. They're making all kinds of concessions to get people into rentals because all the people, well, first of all, because a lot of students didn't come back this year uh, to school, and that's a big part of our city's um, housing inventory. And also because the young people who, like I said, have money to buy, that's what they wanna do while the interest rates are low. So you touched on this, where do you go? You know, you could go to independent assisted living. You could move in with an adult child or family. You could move to an over 55 community. You could co-live co with another senior and you could buy a condo or rent an apartment. You beat me to my slide. <laughs> um, so those are, those are most of the options. There are others, but those are most of the common ones. So if you want to buy and sell at the same time, how do you do that? That's the tricky bit. So uh, number one, I always say, talk to a mortgage lender. And I have invited Sophia Traviakis from Mortgage Network to address that. Um, I'll give you the floor in one second, Sophia. I just want to finish this slide. So number two, if you're going to independent or assisted living, the folks over there are very good at um, figuring out your finances and whether you can afford to live there and, and helping you sell your home and, and transfer the, the assets. Um, and then you want to talk to your realtor about strategies because there are many strategies um, that you can employ when, you're th when you need to buy and sell at the same time. So Sophia, please take it away. Thank you, thank you, Ellen, for inviting me on the call, and I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, Tracy had been asked somebody think asked a question on um, was it why interest rates have dropped? What was the question, Trace? Sorry, for uh, renting, if 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 for one of the people in our audience, if they sell their house, if they move to a condo, it's going to be still the same. It's going to be high, but if they buy, if they rent. My guess is because post COVID rent, rents have gone down. So, um, so that's what I was mentioning. Oh, rents, not yes, rates. Interest, interest rates have, are at an all time low, I believe. They are, yeah. And I think we'll see some volatility this year with interest rates. Our prediction is they will slowly climb, you know, um, as, as needed for some correction to the market. You know, if you are thinking about buying and selling and, um, 
and using a lot of financial advisors uh, are recommending to some of the seniors when they're selling to not use all their cash to maybe buy another cash home or um, you know, to try to use some of, borrow some money from a bank just because the interest rates are low. So definitely talk to your advisors and, and who you, who's helping you figure out where you want to do long-term. But let's say you are purchasing another home, maybe a condo on the Cape or something um, where a retirement area, you definitely want to talk to a, a loan officer or somebody that's local that can help you decide what type of loan is right for you, what type of term, you know, do you want a lower payment and still go on something like a 30-year fixed. Uh, I've had some seniors ask me before if there's some sort of age restriction, like could they get a 30-year mortgage? And they can't. There's no, it's actually legal. We have to be able to offer the same uh, year of products for anybody. So even um, if your question is, could you get a 30-year fixed? You actually, you can't. There's no restriction on what type of uh, a term you do as a senior. And um you know, definitely talk to them about credit. I know a lot of seniors maybe haven't pulled their credit for a very long time. So seeing that and checking your credit ahead of time, if you're trying to maybe buy something else with it, with a mortgage and, and get a need a bank, uh, having them pull your credit in advance will really help because <clears throat> sometimes you just don't know what's on there. If you haven't pulled it for a very long time, maybe I've had seniors that haven't pulled their credit for 10 years. So, you know, checking your credit, making sure you can get a loan, based on your income and if you're getting social security or pension income however your income's coming in make sure all of it's acceptable as well so just talk to a lender as soon as you can you know um i am i didn't even introduce myself <laughs> my name is sophia and i'm a local lender here in boston um i work for mortgage network and we are a, a local direct lender so um you know happy to meet people you know face to face and now a lot over zoom but um any other questions let me know yeah, Sophia, I know that I've talked to some um, active older adults and, and some people have said that, let's say if they're over 70, they may not want to uh, take out a, a mortgage, or a second mortgage, you know, if they're buying some kind of um, uh, second home. Uh, it's just, you know, they're kind of, they're just not, at, at that stage, they may want to, if they have extra cash, put it into something. Mm -hmm. The downside of paying all in cash, I believe, is that um, if you go through a mortgage lender, don't they set up all the information for you? If you're paying cash, so I think it's it's not as um, clear cut like all the all the paperwork. Am I correct in that? Yeah, I mean, when you get a mortgage, we actually do a lot of the legwork, let's say, you know, for the buyer, you know, if it's a condo we're doing, we're setting up all the condo information. We're actually checking the condo. Um, you know, if there's taxes or any insurance, we do help set that all up. But, um, you know, if anybody's happy, uh, happy to help, if anybody needs that help, uh, and they're still buying cash, I'm sure the, you know, real estate agent Ellen is, is wonderful and the attorney and maybe even talking to somebody local that would help you um, do that is great. There's a question from someone on the chat. What income is included by lenders for retirees? What I'm income sure. is included? Um, is sure. Included? I'm not sure. The income that's included, I kind of understand the question. I would say social security. So we can use any social security income as acceptable. Um, any pension income that's filed on your tax returns. A lot of seniors will also, um, actually take maybe withdrawals from uh, from some of their investment uh, portfolios the only the tricky part about pulling money out of the withdrawals it has to it's supposed to be technically a either an annual withdrawal that happens at the same time of year or a monthly withdrawal to be able to use that as income so some people just take some money out randomly as they need it you know, one month they need it, one month they don't. Sometimes that's a little bit of a hard time to use that as income. So definitely talk to your le the lender you're working with if that's the way you do it is acceptable. I don't think there's any other questions. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Okay, so um, again, we were just talking about strategy. If you were going to buy and sell at the same time, the rent back, the subject to seller finding suitable housing. Um, you know, there are ways you can get cash offers quickly. They're typically not uh, at the highest amount that you could get by going the traditional route, but 
that is an option. And I always tell people, if you are thinking you might move, have your home ready to go. You know, do the decluttering now, do the staging possibly, um, you know, not the professional staging that costs money per month, but, you know, have somebody in to make sure that, you know, some home maintenance items have been taken care of. You know, you may have replaced your roof recently, but you didn't paint the ceiling, you know, in the bedroom where the roof leaked, things like that. And, and, and I know because, um, you know, we all live that way. Sometimes life gets in the way and you just forget about it. And you've lived with that stain for 10 years and you don't even notice it anymore. But the first person who comes in your house will notice it. So I always say, you know, get your home ready to go so that if you were able to find what you wanted tomorrow, you could put your home on the market this weekend and it would be a smooth transition because, um, that's how fast this market is moving. It's moving incredibly fast and you have to be ready. So doing the home maintenance and decluttering are two of the biggest things that all of us can do anytime, whether we're thinking of selling or not, because you just never know. Okay. Um, so why you should work with me? Well, I did invite one of my past clients. I don't know if she's made it on the call yet, um, but one of the reasons that I think you should work with me is because I have cultivated all of these amazing resources so that you can have a seamless transition. Like I said before, financial planners, elder lawyers, tax accountants, real estate attorneys, mortgage lenders, senior living advisors, senior move managers, home stagers, whatever you need, we can take care of it. And um, in terms of being a realtor, you know, I think um, my skills include pricing strategies to price your home to sell, uh, excellent marketing to promote your home to all of the best buyers, negotiations to get you the best deals, patience to hold your hand through the entire transaction and make sure you understand every step of the way, and um, strategies for showing your home while keeping you safe that is both COVID and otherwise. You know, in these days of COVID, everybody's um, wearing masks, of course, wearing gloves, wearing booties, not touching anything in the home. It's kind of like, keep your hands in your pockets. The children are not invited into the home at the first showings. Um, you know, the realtor comes in early and turns on all the lights. So no one even touches a light switch. Um, and then when you talk about keeping you safe, otherwise not in times of COVID, those are things like, you know, hiding your medication, taking your medication with you when you leave, hiding your jewelry, hiding anything of value, um, you know, and just not having anything out in the open. And it's also, you know, changing out, um, you know, family pictures. You don't want to show your entire family on the wall because you just never know. I mean, these days with in COVID, we are able to be a lot more safe than ever before in terms of getting people to sign in, giving us their phone numbers, their addresses. So, you know, we always can use it for contact tracing, but it's, you know, it's something we've always tried to get, but sometimes haven't been so lucky, but now it's really, changed a bit. Um, so how to work with a real estate professional? You know, um, I enjoy meeting with my clients in person as much as possible. But if you have a computer or iPad, we can do Zoom meetings. We are very used to working with your adult children and keeping all parties in the loop. We communicate by phone, text, email, whatever, whatever you need. Uh, my client, Charna, I don't know if she's made it on the call, but she did not have a computer. She did have a phone and text, but I would just go over there a lot. If I wanted to see her or give her a document, I would just drive over and it was a nice visit we could have. And I could keep 
tabs that she's doing the decluttering she needed to be doing while I was presenting her with the documents that she needed to sign. Um, so I think that's all I have. That's my contact information. Tracy, can you see if Charna's made it on the call? Uh, I texted her. She did not answer me back. I texted her all your information. Um, and I also asked her, did she get on? And she has not answered. Oh, OK. But well, I have questions, not yes. me. OK. First question is, what is the average time for a home to sell in Newton these days, given the different price tiers? So, you know, you've got houses, you know, two, three million dollars, and then you've got houses that are less. So given the different price tiers, what's the average time for a home to sell in Newton these days? Um, well, the lower tiered homes always sell first, you know, the condos that are five, six, seven hundred thousand sell very quickly. Honestly, everything is selling quickly right now. Everything. I think, um, you know, it used to be before COVID, the higher end, the three million dollar or two million dollar and up homes would take much longer to sell. And then when COVID came, they were gone in a weekend as well, because the people who can afford them want them they want the space last year if you had a pool you were selling in a weekend because there were no pools open there were no beaches open if you had a pool your house was gone in a in a minute and, and bidding wars have been going on all through covid so i mean every price point is selling quickly it just has to be priced right and you really need a professional to tell you what that price is because we're in the market every day. And just don't trust Zillow. <laughs> That's all I can say. Zillow is a resource that everybody thinks is the best thing since sliced bread, but they don't know your home. They're looking at the neighborhood. They're not looking at each individual home. And half the time they're wrong. So, you know, realtors will come in or even by video conference, if you can walk around your home and, and show them the, the attributes, we can get a good sense. I mean, I had that happen recently and it wasn't great because the person wasn't showing me the flaws. And so I didn't see that there was chipped paint, you know, or whatever. So, um, you know, if you can if you can let somebody in, that is always best. But if you can't, a video tour is the second best thing. But um, we really can give you a much more accurate assessment of what your house will sell for than any computer program could. Two more questions. Uh, someone um, in the chat wrote, "Their kitchen's very old and kind of ugly." Uh, I hope it's not that ugly. I hope you can still cook, but they said it's it's ugly. And they're questioning, they want to move. Should they remodel? Or, um, you know, if they do sell their house, should they let the new owner do that? And then if they do remodel, well, you know, let's say they spend X amount of money. Are they going to recoup that when they go to sell their house? So that's their question. Yeah, that's a great question. That's, that's the age old question. Um, my personal opinion on that is no, you should not spend the money to remodel. However, because your taste may not be what the new owners want and they may end up ripping it out anyway, I do think that having more eyes on it, like a realtor or a designer stager, like Deb Ellis, you know, we can tell you, let's we, we come in with a different set of eyes and we may say, you know, your cabinets could just get painted and that will improve the look tremendously. Or maybe you just need to upgrade your countertop and that is not a very expensive fix and that will do a world of wonder. Sometimes it's not a complete remodel that's really necessary. It's just one thing that would really change the look of it. And you've been looking at it for years. So you, you know, 
it looks different to you than it does to to a new eye. So I would definitely have new eyes take a look at it. Um, I wanted to mention another thing that I offer is if you do decide there are some larger ticket items that need to be repaired or remodeled, I do have a contractor that I work with who offers to do that work for you and get paid at closing. So you don't have to pay them up front to do that work. Um, and like I said, it's it really just depends on what it is, but you would be amazed at how just cleaning and decluttering and, and having a fresh set of eyes see your space and having ideas about how to move things around or or change one little thing could really uh, benefit you. So I don't I don't often recommend like a whole kitchen remodel, but sometimes sometimes it just depends. You know if you're gonna get, and and again it depends on the neighborhood. You know if you're in, um, you know a very popular, expensive neighborhood where I see you know things in good condition are going for x and yours is nowhere near that but it's only going to take you a little bit to get there then yeah it might be worth it but again you really need a professional to tell you what's happening in your area in your neighborhood in your building even you know if penthouse units are going for two million and you're on the 11th floor let's say let's say it's a 12-story building and you're on the 11th floor and you're almost at that level, but then you're, but then you haven't updated in 50 years. Yeah, update a little bit because you will get pretty close to that that number. You know, it just depends. It really depends. Ellen, your guest is trying to get on, and I'm asking Sean to see if uh, he can help her. So, Sean, if you can hear this, I just put it in the chat. We're we're, we're trying to get her on. Oh, okay. um, question: What percentages? do real estate agents receive today? So usually, you know, if you go to buy the house, you're going with a realtor to see the house and then there's the realtor for the seller. So it's two realtors. So um, what percentages they're asking? So the way that commissions work? Commissions, yep. Um, so in Massachusetts, we have um, designated agency, which means that the seller is entitled to an agent and the buyer is entitled to their own agent. I know when my parents bought their house 40 something years ago, they were getting taken around town by the seller's agent. There were no buyer's agents. And so they would tell the seller's agent everything about them. Yes, we just moved here. You know, we can spend up to, you know, a hundred thousand dollars is a long time ago. We can spend up to a hundred thousand dollars, and then she she would go and tell the seller, "Well, they can spend up to a hundred, you know, even though the house the house might be priced, you know, it, it would it would uh, stifle their negotiation ability. But now that each party can have their own representation, everything is much more private and, um, you know, confidential. So, so. Typically in Massachusetts, typically a seller pays the commission for the seller's broker um, 5%. It can be more, it can be less, but very typically it's 5%. And then when a buyer comes with a buyer's agent, that company that they work for is entitled to whatever the seller's agent is offering. So typically, the seller is paying for both parties, but and the seller typically pays 5%, and typically the, that is split in half. So whoever represents the buyer gets 2.5%, and whoever represents the seller gets 25 Not Not the person, but the company they work for. Oh, it's not the realtor that gets the 2.5%? No, the realtor does not get that money. The money goes to the brokerage, and then the realtor has a relationship, a fiduciary relationship with their brokerage that they get a percentage of it. They certainly don't get all of it. Okay. So, but it, again, if there's two realtors, it's 5% total. So it's typically two and a half percent. The seller's 
realtor and two and a half percent the buyer's buyer. Right. Realtor. Right. And it really is worth it to have a buyer's agent. A lot of people think I'll just go straight to the seller's agent and I'll I'll get that two and a half percent or the seller's agent will discount me the two and a half percent but it's not a good idea. First of all, they don't have to do that. They've already signed a, a contract with the seller that says I'm going to pay you 5%. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And secondly, I mean, they can lower their fee if they want to, depending on what brokerage they work for. But secondly, you know, they already have a fiduciary relationship with the seller. So it's impossible for them to have to be able to represent both parties. Like I said, how it, that's sort of how it used to be, that a seller's agent would try to represent both sides and they can't be, they can't be loyal and, and confidential to, to any party. They, they then become more of a facilitator. So I don't typically work that way. I don't like to, to do that because I like to get to know my clients. I like to know what they need and give them everything they need. And if I, you know, the only reason that I would, that I would do it is for my own pocket. And that's not, that's not enough of a reason. The reason is I want to do well by my client. Okay. Another question, and this can really be for anywhere. Someone's asking, what's the best way to find a good realtor in Connecticut? but um, her partner needs to sell a home there. So I guess that could be for any state in the country. If you live here and you're trying to sell a home somewhere else. Yeah, if you have a trusted realtor anywhere, they can always refer you. Like I work for Keller Williams. We have the largest real estate company in the world. So what I do is if you need a referral in Connecticut and you call me and I can interview you or your friend and say, what are, what are they looking for? What do they need? What are their goals? I can then interview. I can put out uh, a notice. We have uh, websites, Facebook pages. We have all kinds of ways to, to reach people in different cities across the country. And I can then interview people on your behalf to make sure that you get the best agent in wherever you want to go. So that's everywhere. And even many countries, not in America, but I can't name them all right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, your, your trusted realtor is the best way to find another trusted realtor. So another person's asking, how can they figure out if it would be better to sell to a developer versus an individual? And I know where I live in South Newton, which is near the Memorial Spalding School, that homes that don't look, the homes that are substantial homes are getting knocked down to put like $3 million homes. So the question is, just like this person asked is, you know, do you hold out for the developer to give the highest price because they want that land or do you sell to an individual? So what are your thoughts on that? That's a really good question. Um, I'm actually dealing with that right now. Um, I have a I have a, a woman, a senior who lives in Wellesley, who has a very, very small house on a very big lot. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very small house, very old and small. And it is um, ripe for a teardown because um, because the lot is so big and the, and the developers will pay top dollar to get the lot so that they can then build a giant house. Um, so again, I hate to keep saying it depends, but, but um, if you know your house is a knockdown, you know, the best way to sell it, in my opinion, is to hire a realtor who pits all of the builders against each other. Like, I, I don't mean that in, uh, in a negative way, but it ex like, like exposes the property to all of the developers. You could call, let's just say, let's just say you have, you know, an acre lot in Newton and, and a very old tired house that you can't, that you don't think would appeal to anybody right now. Um, if you hire a realtor, they would, they would think of, several strategies. So the first strategy would be, let's write this up and let's send it to 
25, 30 builders. Let's let them drive by it. We don't have to let them in because they're not interested in the house. So let's let them drive by it. Let's give them the specs on the zoning, on the lot lines, the plot plan, all that. And then let's call for offers by March 15th. That's one strategy. Um, that is going to net you more money than if you just call one or two builders yourself. All right, your guest is on, but I just wanna finish up with the questions very quickly. The first easy question is the person who asked about the out of state realtor, do you charge a fee? Do you charge a fee to interview, um, to do that no. interview, the out of state realtor? No. Okay, second question. If you did remodel your kitchen, how much actually would be recovered in the sale price? But I guess that's probably, we don't know how much you, how much, how extensive was the remodel and she doesn't really know how big your house is. So, right, Ellen, that's, right, that's right. A tough to answer. I mean, you could remodel, you could tell me you're remodeling your kitchen and it could all be for mica. That's gonna be a lot different than if you remodel in uh, quartz. Right, right. You know, so you really need to talk to a designer or a realtor or someone who will advise you on where to spend your money and what to spend it on. And last quick question before you introduce your guest. Um, when you have an agent in the house to estimate the selling price from agency X, are you stuck with that agent from agency X to sell the house or can you choose another agent from agency X? No, you're never stuck with anybody. <laughs> you are in control of your home. If you invite somebody in and they give you a presentation on what they think your home is worth and you don't either agree with them, like them, click with them, you are under no obligation to use them. You may call anybody from any agency anytime you want. Okay, and then just to get, I know we want to introduce the guest, but the person who asked about the remodeling is not is still asking, they're saying if it's a full remodel with nice stuff, but again, nice stuff, you know, I, I, I agree with what Ellen's saying. It's very hard if you put in, you know, it might look nice to, to one person, but somebody else, you know, the, the levels, but they're saying what percentage of the cost would you recoup? Yeah, I'm really sorry. I really can't, can't give you a, a, a number. I mean, I've seen people remodel who haven't re recouped any of it because what they chose wasn't appealing. I've seen people remodel who recoup all of it. You know, it, it, it just depends. It just depends, especially timing, neighborhood, you know, like, like right now, the market is at the highest I've ever seen. I mean, I saw a home get 25 offers this weekend. So, you know, I'm sure that house went, recouped every penny that they spent on staging and everything else. Um, you know, the more you can prepare your home to appeal to the most amount of people, you will recoup the most amount of money. So, it's decluttering and staging, just like the other weeks that we, that's why I brought those experts this in this series. The, the woman said if she spends 70,000, any guess? She's just looking for guesses, it looks like. So 70,000 on a kitchen. That probably would not include an expansion. Again, I don't know if you're in a $3 million house or a $50,000 house. I don't know, I can't answer that. I, if right. you're in a, you know, Condo, I wouldn't spend that kind of money on a kitchen. She said you know? she's in a one million dollar type house. Are you in Newton? Answer. Let's see if she's in Newton. Are you in Newton? Just write it to me. Yeah, she lives in Newton. Yeah. One million. You think the value is one million? That's what she's saying. Yeah. Um. Is it is it bigger than twenty five hundred square feet? Just write in the chat. Yes, it is bigger than 2,500 square feet. Yep. Um, Putting in the chat. Yeah, I mean, you probably if you do it very tastefully and modern and what people are looking for today, you probably would recoup most of it, half of it, some of it. I don't know. It's so hard to commit. But Ellen, is it worth? You know, if so, again, I'm just 
throwing the devil's advocate, if someone's been in their house for 40, 50 years, I mean, I remodeled my kitchen 28, 27 years ago. It, it's a whole job, um, the person who asked, right? It's it's not- It's, it's not, a job and, it's a and it takes job. time. It's, it's and the amount of time that it might take, the market <laughs> might've changed by then. You're so, right. Okay. It's a big job. I mean, it, okay, so the millennials today that are buying homes do like, turnkey homes they like homes where they don't have to do anything you know i showed a home to some millennials recently that had a big yard it was covered in snow and the woman looked at a tree and said when there's no snow that tree is going to have a lot of leaves that fall that's going to require maintenance right and i was like yeah it is it's going to require a lawnmower and maybe a tree guy and maybe, you know, uh, landscaping and gutter cleaning. I mean, there's a lot that goes into taking care of a home. And she was like, oh, forget it. I don't want it. I don't want, I don't want a big yard. So the millennials really want something they don't have to do much to. And they are really interested in townhomes and condos more than I've ever seen before. The, the, thought of a big home and a big yard is daunting to a lot of them but that being said you know there are lots of other buyers it may not be a millennial who buys your house there's lots of people out there who are looking to move and some people want different things some people want to renovate their own kitchen if they're going to save money by having an older kitchen and they have vision then they're a good buyer but by the time you remodel your kitchen, the market may be different. The market is very volatile right now. It is hot, hot, hot today. And as Sophia can attest, like the rates went up crazy. When was that? Last Friday? For like a minute? I think they came down again today, but you know, it's crazy. You don't know that we're gonna be in this market in three months. It could be different. And Ellen, oh. for people just to, you know, not do as much work, uh, I think typically, and I'm not a realtor, so I don't hold me to this, but I think like hardwood floors, if people get out of that carpet and put some hardwood floors, maybe just paint their walls a very light color. And like you said, with the kitchen, maybe just to have someone, you know, do the cabinets on a white. Um, so it just, it looks more clean and get rid of their clutter. That might go a long way versus spending a lot of cash in a kitchen that still you're not sure if that's going to be up to the standards of the buyer. Is that correct, Ellen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's Hardwood floors we, and we paint. Those are the two on. big things. You got it. All right. Is your guest on? I don't know. I don't see her. Sharna, uh, are you here? Sean told me she's on. Oh, here she is. I see her. Sharna, can you please put your camera and get off mute? I just taught Sharna how to use uh, Zoom a few weeks ago, so give her a minute. Want to introduce her, Ellen? While she's trying yeah, to so her. Sharna is um, a client. There she is. She's got a different name on her thing, but don't you can you unmute Sharna? So Sharna sold her condo. Nope, we still can't hear you. Is there any way Sean can unmute her? Oh, yeah. We are working on it, yep. You got it? There. Yep, she's unmuted. Yes, Thank you're you, perfect, Sharon. you're perfect. I'm gonna introduce you. So <laughs> Sharna had a condo in Chestnut Hill and Sharna's son knew a friend of mine who referred me to her son and I went over and I met with them together and they decided to hire me to sell her condo and she moved to New Jersey and she took all of my advice she did the handyman work and she did the decluttering she hired Eve who we had on a few weeks ago and she did staging and she well, Eve also handled the whole move, not just the decluttering, but the organizing, getting her a mover, getting her things in two different 
trips. We had one trip of some things that went to um, storage while well, we had some staged furniture and then we combined all of her furniture together 30 days later to get it to New Jersey. So Sharna has had the experience of working with me and many of the vendors that I've recommended throughout this series. So I just thought she could talk for a minute about what her experience was. Hi, nice to see you again, Ellen. Um, I want to start out by saying, and I'll try to keep this short, I thought about moving for a long time, downsizing, um, several years. And when I finally made the decision and had the uh, wonderful coincidence of having Ellen connected to a friend of my son's, um, that was enough for me to, to meet with her and see what she had to offer. Um, if you ask me what she had to offer, she had everything. She was kind, she was patient. She um, did not make my decisions, but she helped me to decide. Um, she could point out flaws. She was able to suggest, as she mentioned, vendors with packing and with the moving itself. Um, I had someone come in and clean thoroughly the apartment. And finally, I had a stager. The apartment went from looking like a 1970s maybe uh, place to today. When I walked back in after the staging, I didn't want to leave. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of thinking, a lot of planning, um, making decisions, what you do and don't want, things you can't part with, take a photo of that image. Um, what else can I say? Ellen was available anytime. And I mean, anytime. She was the person that people talk about being fabulous real estate um, people, except there aren't any like her because she really, the top of the game. I mean, I, I can't say enough. And uh, unless there's something in particular people would like to ask, or Ellen, you want to put me point me in a direction, I'm here. Thank you, Sharna. That's so lovely. I really appreciate those words. And I open it up to anyone who wants to ask Sharna how her experience was with using any of the vendors, not necessarily only me. And just the actually even just being a senior and going through a move. You thought about it for a long time and it was overwhelming probably, right? Very. The overwhelming was overwhelming. So is there a way you can tell some of these other people how to, how to bite the bullet? How, you know, was that the best decision that you made? You know? Well, I, I have to admit that um, my thinking is not the same as it was five years ago, for example. And I sometimes get confused about things. The next to best thing of Ellen being hired was that she worked directly with my son, who is 52, uh, not a baby. Um, they had most of the conversation. They always got back to me and reported. Ellen would send me an email. She would give me a call on the phone. She would give me a heads up if there was anything I needed to be aware of. Um, and I mention this particularly because she is able to uh, glean information from different people. The one thing is you really have to listen to her, think about what she's saying, and then make a decision. Um, do not let yourself get overwhelmed by several people making decisions. I absented myself from all of it. Um, and uh, I'm very happy that I did um, because there are so many things to uh, take care of, documents as well as the actual setting. And my condo sold first weekend First looker, first buyer um, was that first weekend. The, the buyer was that weekend. 
So, but it wasn't the only buyer. We waited. Oh no! We stalled a little bit, and we waited because there was a lot of other interest, and we we you know strategically waited for another offer so we could put them against each other and get the price up a little bit. So. Um, we do and I think Ellen is. I think Ellen is a wonderful negotiator. To wit, I did not meet the new owner, and I felt perfectly comfortable <laughs> with Ellen handling things. Um, so, and then I, I had, she reported to me, and we were thrilled because, in fact, I think she's a very good um, negotiator. And she also is able um, to have a soft hand with a malleable glove. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, how do you negotiate? Because I know I mentioned earlier, I, I just bought something recently and the realtors told me that they don't have the other asking prices. For I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. The realtors how what? How does a realtor negotiate in the sense that I just purchased something couple of weeks ago with my husband and um, the realtors, when we asked what the other bids were, we were trying to bid against people. The realtors said, even if they knew, they said they weren't allowed to tell us what the bids were. They couldn't say to go higher, lower. They, they, were, they were not allowed to tell us that but legally. So how can you negotiate if you're, if you're uh, not allowed to know what the other bids are? Are you, are you, asking about negotiating on behalf of the seller or behalf of the buyer? So I, so we had a realtor who um, was our realtor. So that we're the buyer and we were looking at something and we wanted to put in a bid. We weren't sure to bid over because that's what's going on now. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard in this market, you know, to know, but you know, we all have we all have our nuances. We all, I mean, I've been in this business for 17 years. I know almost all the brokers that I come up against and I know um, how to sweet talk them in a way. It's not, I mean, you know, yes, the, the bidding is typically blind and you don't know. And it is very frustrating to think that you could be bidding against yourself. That is the worst. When someone says, well, we do have another offer, you know, do you want to raise yours? And you don't know how much you have to raise it. Um, there are ways, there are ways to speak to the listing broker and explain your situation. Um, you know, I can't give you all my secrets, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I can just say I've been very successful on both on both sides of the seller and the buyer. There are ways, like like Sharna said, you have to have a soft hand, but you know, a firm resolve. So and I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're we're going to have to wrap it up and we've we've enjoyed this. Um so let's say you are Sharna and you're hiring Ellen or a different realtor to represent you, you know. Someone, Ellen comes to your house and looks at your house and you're going to sell your house. So let's say you've had water through the years in your basement or you've had a leaky roof, but it's not obvious right now because it's summertime and no one can tell that. What is the seller? What are the people on the call that have had their houses for 50 years and may not have fixed up everything? And what is their obligation to tell you the truth? And if they tell you the truth, what is your obligation to tell the buyer? That's, that's the million dollar question right there. Don't tell the realtor anything that you, don't tell the realtor. Once we know we have an ethical obligation to disclose it, you do not. Um, you, have, you have an ethical obligation to, um, to disclose things that are active. If you had a leaky roof 20 years ago and you fixed it, tell people that. You know, be upfront about it. Um, you know, we were with Sharna, we were very, we were, we disclosed she had an older heating system. And um, we disclosed that right up front. And I think, you know, 
that was the right thing to do. I mean, any any inspector who looked at it could say, you have an older heating system. So, but a buyer doesn't know. You know, buyers haven't looked at a lot of heating systems. They don't know what a new one or an old one looks like if this is their first time shopping for a home. So, um, you know, I do think that if you have an active problem, you need to disclose it. But I also think it's your ethical obligation to fix it if you can. If you know that you have termites, get a termite contract in place. So therefore you can then say, we used to have termites, but then we had a termite contract and now we don't have them anymore. So I do think you should fix the bigger ticket items because you know, nobody wants to sell something in bad faith. You know, if you know you have a problem with your heating system and the next family has a fire the first week that they move in, how are you going to feel? Absolutely. So I do encourage sellers to fix things that are, that are like that, big ticket items and things that could be dangerous, but um, don't tell the realtor. <laughs> All right, we have to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much, Charna, for your guest appearance. And thank you to both for your guest appearance. And thank you, Ellen, for hosting our series and also for speaking today. Uh, next week, we have a busier week. We start up again next Monday. We have adapted seated exercises to enhance your fitness with Kim next Monday. And next Tuesday, we have uh, someone coming on and they're speaking about Sinatra and the Rat Pack but they're also playing music and giving us the background information. There'll be pictures on the screen. And next Thursday, we have our caregiver support group and um, Memory Cafe is going to be with uh, haiku, which is sort of like poetry, but just three lines. So even if you don't regularly come to our Memory Cafe, come to this, I, I think people are going to really enjoy it. Um, and all the links, the Zoom links will go out on Sunday for the, for the week. So thank you so much to everybody. Thank you for attending our series. And um, if you have any questions, you can always email me and I can, I can send the emails to, to Ellen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having this series. All I want right. to do it again. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Sean, for everything.